Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the Kirk of the Hills, which has um, hosted our class for so many years, um, 30, over 30 years. And thank you, Lord, for um, their flexibility and um, always making a space for us. Father, would this, uh, we ask that um, in this time that we've set apart to be before your word and with your people that um, it would not be in vain that we would, as we seek you, we would find you, that you would show yourself to us, um, that you would speak to us through your word, by your spirit, um, that we would, Lord, we ask that we would uh, love your son, the Lord Jesus, more um, by the end of tonight than we do even right now. So Father, would you be with us and be with my words? Uh, help me to say what is uh, true and honors Jesus. We pray in his name, amen. So if you've had a performance review, um, you probably have had parts of that that you enjoyed slash looked forward to more than other parts. No, <laughs> Diane's saying no. Um, so there are sometimes in some performance reviews, there are some good parts, right? And those are the, you know, oh, you've done a good job with that project and you've saved the company money or you've worked hard, you've shown initiative. Um, and so uh, what are the harder parts of a performance review? Areas for yes. <laughs> Here are some areas that we think you need to improve. Um, and uh, this evaluation, um, whenever I've had a performance review, like this has been the part of the performance review that's been harder for me to show that somehow I'm not Mary Poppins and practically perfect in every single way, that there's, that, you know, that I have room for growth um, and wondering maybe that's been hard for you too. And um, so I wonder, what do you do with correction? Why is correction so hard to receive? And then once you accept correction, What's it like to become a new you, a new version of you? Or um, what's it like for us to become a new version of us? I heard it described once um, this way in the process. If, you have, um, if you're a note taker and you picked up your pen, um, so I can see a lot of people with their pens out, it's awesome, or you're taking notes on your phone, you probably, what, how did you decide? What happened right before you did that? Did you, did you, spend some time in deliberation or pray earnestly, Lord, please show me which hand I should use to pick up my pen and write with. Probably not, right? You, um, you just picked it up and you started writing and why is that? Yeah, because you've got, there's something in our wiring so that one of your hands is likely more dominant than the other just neurologically. And then there's years of practice, like miss all the Mrs. Bowser and Mrs. Eichelberger and Mr. Jones practice of like writing, writing, printing. And um, it was uh, something that you and I have just, we have a dominant hand and we use it. And so um, if you were to take your pen and switch it to the other hand and try to take notes with that other hand, or if you're typing or texting in your phone, like that you would switch your typing finger. I tried to do that today, it was super hard um, and frustrating. And so it feels awkward and you make mistakes. You go slower than you think you should. It gets frustrating and it's really tempting to switch back. Um, God calls us as followers of Jesus to learn how to write with our opposite hand, our non-dominant hand. Of course, I don't mean that literally, right? Um, but God is calling us to learn to live and to think and to be and to feel a totally different way. And it goes, it's not a superficial change, but it's a complete overhaul, a rewiring of our natural selves where you and I, we naturally, we're just wired this way. We look out for ourselves. We're worried when there's cake going around. I'm worried, like, 
am I gonna get the right piece of cake? Like I want the corner piece. I'm not interested in whether Hannah wants that piece or Leanne wants that piece. Like I, I want that for myself. I want the job um, promotion. I don't want somebody else to get it. Um, you and I just in our natures, we are wired to look out for ourselves. And God, when he calls us to Christ, he's making us new and he's um, calling us to trust him with um, our ordering of our lives. And um, so in 1 Corinthians, the letter that we're, we're in our second week of our four weeks little mini study, we can see God's loving pursuit of his people. And um, in this, as he's, he claims the people for himself and he calls them to be different um, and, and look more like Jesus. And so um, the apostle Paul, we saw this in his second missionary journey, spent over 18 months in Corinth. Corinth was a, a Roman colony. Um, it was strategically located um, in what we would think of as Greece um, on an isthmus, and it was a place of great financial opportunity. There was a lot of goods traded hands. Um, goods went west to east, east to west, north to south, south to north. So there were a lot of opportunities for um, financial opportunity. And um, the city was only 100 years old, about a little bit over at the time. Um, it had been an ancient city and the Romans, the Romans destroyed it um, in 146 BC. And so then it was remade, it was resettled because it was so strategic. Why would you ever want to give that up? Um, on this little isthmus. And so in that, a uh, hundred year old cities, so it was sort of like Miami, Anchorage, Tijuana, um, Las Vegas. Those are about hundred year old cities in, that we would be familiar with. Um, and so they're new cities, they're cities that, this is, Corinth was a city that attracted upwardly mobile, ambitious people. Um, soldiers who were retiring, they had money, but they wanted prestige and they couldn't, they could climb the ladder easier out in the colonies than they could actually in and around Rome. And so um, this was a very cosmopolitan city. Um, people had a lot of diverse backgrounds and there's traders coming through. A lot of languages are spoken there. You can imagine there were a lot of gods that were worshiped there. Um, there were a lot of morals that were, were represented there. Um, there were a lot of cultures represented there. And Corinth in general saw itself as a big deal. Corinth was a big deal. And this is probably, if you're a church planner, <laughs> Maybe you would think like, wow, this will not be an easy place to start a church, a Christian church. And yet these, um, God is in the habit of sending his gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ into the hardest and darkest places. And so he sent very deliberately, um, as we saw in Acts, uh, through the ministry of Paul and others, uh, he sent the gospel. And by his grace, many Corinthians believed. And when they believed, they received eternal life. Um, these, these people had been spiritually dead and now they were spiritually alive in Christ. And yet they had to unlearn what they had learned, as Yoda would say, from their, from their culture. They needed to be rewired um, because they had a dominant hand that was um, ambitious and idolatrous, sexually permissive, um, these other ways of thinking about the world um, than what God had, God calls his people to, to do and be. And so we saw that it started in chapters one to four of 1 Corinthians that Paul corrected Corinthian attitudes on wisdom and how they were, there were rivalries within the church. And he explained that is not what God is, that is not who God has made you to be. And so as we go on in chapters five to seven tonight, if you want to get out your Bibles, now would be a good time to do that or turn them on. Um, Paul continues to be an agent of God's correction. And he's responding to problems that he had heard about and problems and or slash questions that the the Corinthians themselves had written to him about. And so as we study tonight, I think we can learn that God is recreating a people for himself 
in Christ Jesus, a people who reflect Jesus to him, to each other, and to the watching world. This is a wholehearted people that he's creating. And this is a new identity that, this new identity Jesus has secured for us in his work on the cross. So there's, when God is making us new, it doesn't mean that we're trying to earn our way or make ourselves better in his eyes. Because of the blood of, of the because of the blood of Christ, we there's nothing you and I can do to make ourselves more desirable to the Lord, and yet He is so committed to us. Our eternal life is already now. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are eternally alive now. But God doesn't just whisk us away and like you know we're in heaven with Him. We get to spend the years, however many years He gives us in our life to learn how to cooperate with him, to learn his faithfulness, to learn how forgiving and gracious he is, to learn what a good master, what a good teacher he is. And um, we, um, there is, uh, so God is calling us out and into a, a, a fuller relationship with himself, not in the sense that we're earning any part of it, but um, that we would be more reflective and more aware of what Jesus has done for us and who we are in Christ. And so there is beauty and heartache in this. If you've walked with the Lord even a week, (laughs) you know that there is great beauty and there's also heartache because God calls us to let things go, things that we have loved very, very dearly. And he cries them (laughs) out of our hands. God is in charge and it's hard to learn. It's painful to be rewired. It often involves his correction. God does not, and we'll see this tonight, he does not rope off or he does not stay out of any area that we rope off away from him. He pushes in and um, there is no area of your life or mine that does not need the gospel does not need God's correction. And he corrects us because he loves us, not because he hates us, the opposite of that. He loves us. And so we tonight are going into some really tough areas. Um, We're gonna talk about sexuality, relationships, singleness, marriage, divorce, um, personal rights. These are areas that pull at the deep desires of our hearts and also areas where our culture has very strong values, very dominant hand values that are not in line with what God, who God is calling us to be. And so um, the encouragement for you and me is that we can pray and us together, we can pray for God's comfort. Comfort, it will be awkward. It's awkward to walk into these areas. It's it's awkward sometimes to even talk about them. Um, We have grace, his grace for making mistakes and we can pray for that. And we need his help in keeping our hearts teachable because fundamentally our identity in Christ is one of humility, that we are no longer our own masters but we submit to him, he is our master, and to be teachable so that we would learn from him and learn from his word. And so um, if, this, if you're gonna struggle tonight, be encouraged because that is one sign that God is at work in you and that you are no longer content with just walking however you're living, however you want, but that he has, make, he has made you new, you have a new heart, and you're not gonna be content with the old ways that once were so comfortable. Um, and so it's also encouragement, I think, for us that, to, that God will pursue us to make us like Jesus. Um, he's gonna help us address problems we can't see. And that's, we're gonna look at that chapters five to chapter six. Um, Paul just seems to be addressing problems within the Corinthian church, problems that they could not see, but that still needed to be addressed. Um, and we are not that different than they. So I'm sure that you and me and us together, we have things, we have problems that we cannot see and we need God's help in addressing that. And then also um, chapter seven, it will be um, sometimes there are problems that we know about. And so Paul is gonna help the Corinthian church start to help them with problems that they had written to him about and they knew that they needed his counsel. 
Okay, so there's our outline, chapters five and six. God's gonna help us with problems we can't see. Chapter seven, God's gonna help us with problems we already know about. Um, that is the set we're starting, we're sort of straddling this section. It's sort of an awkward um, three, for to have these three chapters because we're finishing the problems that they didn't know about and we're going on even to like past chapter, uh, definitely into chapter 10, but I think even into chapter 15 is about problems that the Corinthian church had written to Paul about. Okay, with that, like, how are we doing? Oh my goodness, sorry people. But that's the big picture. So I know you guys are gonna talk about it. So just briefly, we'll go through, just to give you a heads up, if you didn't have time to look at these chapters yet, chapters five and six, um, Paul is gonna address three problems. And so, um, in chapter five, all of chapter five, he is addressing the fact that in the Corinthian church, there is a man who publicly, blatantly is pursuing a, um, sexual immorality. And so um, that's one problem. The underlying problem is that the church is evidently really proud about how gracious they're being to him with that. Um, we can see that verses, uh, chapter five, verses two and verses six. Um, even though this particular type of um, incest was actually against Roman law, um, that a man would be in a relationship with his father's wife, so his stepmom. Um, and so they don't realize, the Corinthian church doesn't realize how contagious sin is um, or what it means that Jesus, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed to for our sin. And they don't understand that God does expect believers to lovingly hold each other accountable. Um, in matters of practical living. And so that's the first problem. Second problem, chapter six, verses one to eight, um, there were believers who were taking each other to court. Um, and so the underlying problem there is that these believers didn't trust or realize that God would give wisdom to the church leaders to help believers navigate those disagreements. And so um, he's calling them to not act in self-interest, but in the interest of others. We can see that chapter six, um, verses seven and eight. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've already been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong and you do this to your brothers. So there's a, this is a family problem and it's shameful, certainly in that culture, because you would never take your family member to court. That would be a very shameful act in, the, um, in that Roman culture. And so, um, ra and so the consequence was, as he says in um, verse back in verse six, is that they're doing all this and squabbling and fighting and um, not even doing it in the church, like, not even doing it in the church, but doing it um, in front of unbel unbelievers. So it was um, not a good witness for Jesus. Uh, problem number three, uh, chapter six, verses nine to twenty. Um, believers were, seems to be some believers were living as if what they did with their physical bodies had no connection to the, their spiritual condition. And so <clears throat> evidently, and we'll, we'll get into more of this with food and um, um, other appetites, but they were treating um, sexual desires as if they could just um, you know, it's just something that sort of get out of the way so you can focus on the rest of your life. And Paul explains that our bodies matter to God. Um, there is no fracture of self. Um, we are whole. God has made us whole people and God desires his people to be wholly his. And so um, we can see that uh, starting in 13b, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Look at the dignity that Paul, that Paul points out God has given to our physical human bodies. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself to the prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh and he who unites himself with the Lord, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. 
And so um, because believers had been united to Christ, what we do with our physical bodies in some way that probably you and I can't fully understand has a real connection with our relation, our personal relationship with the Lord, but also the entire body of believers. We are Christ, Paul talks about us, the church as being um, Christ's body. Um, so God didn't call people who were already pure and fine and um, worthy to be joined in this way to Christ, to be the inheritor, inheritors of his kingdom. No, he did, the people that he called to be joined with Christ were, were once wicked people. And we can see that in um, chapter six, verse nine, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Do you see what he's doing there? He's saying, God in making a people for himself took wicked people like that and made them clean, they were washed, sanctified. He declared them holy, they were set apart for himself they were justified. They were declared righteous before the Lord because of the Christ, because of Christ's sacrifice, um, and their trust in Him. And so, um, that sin died. That guilt and shame that they had carried, the guilt and shame that you and I in our lives have carried before we can come to the Lord Jesus. That's old, that's dead. That is what we once were. I was a liar, I was sexually promiscuous. I was a lot of other things. <laughs> that was what I was. But God just looked on me with love and compassion and brought me into this new relationship where I'm new and I'm pure and I'm holy and I'm joined with Jesus Christ, his son, which is such an honor. You and I cannot fully grasp the honor that it is for the, the son of God, the pure divine, holy man, holy, fully God, fully man, son of God to be united with him. We who were once his enemies. It's amazing. Do you see what Paul is doing there? He's not giving us a list of rules to say, these are God's standards. God doesn't want you to do this. God doesn't want you to do this. God doesn't want you to do this. I mean, that should be enough for us as followers of the Lord. That should be enough. And yet he's doing more. He's saying, he is pulling at our hearts to say, look at how much God loves you. Look at what he's done for you. And so to lift our eyes out of, you know, and. Sexual desire is really attractive. It's super fun. And Paul knows we need more than a list of rules to win our hearts. And so he's lifting our chin so that we can see the Lord. We can see how much he loves us and be willing to follow him in hard and painful ways as we're corrected um, and trust him that he knows what is the life of flourishing that he's called us to. Um, and so that's the heart of this passage. I think uh, all these chapters is really um, that verse, verses nine to 11, especially verse 11. Um, Paul is talking about identity, not behavior, who God has declared us to be. Okay, so a principle I think we can learn from this is that God wants his people to be whole holy his. God wants his people to be holy his, not just look like Jesus, not just sound like Jesus, but actually sometimes, I know Sam's giving me a funny look. Yeah, we should look like Jesus, right? But not just look like Jesus. Or on sometimes when we put on our church clothes, we're like Jesus and then we can look, then we can do whatever we want. God wants us whole holy his, so that there's no part of us that's outside of his lordship. Um, Tis the season of chocolate bunnies. 
I don't know if you like chocolate bunnies. <laughs> My first instinct about bunnies, chocolate bunnies, is excitement. But I've learned you have to temper that. Because not so fast. I can remember my very first chocolate bunny that I got, I don't know how old I was, like, I don't know, six, seven, eight, I have no idea. But I can remember, like, I got the chocolate bunny and I opened it up and I took a bite and oh my, the disappointment. The disappointment, what's, what's wrong? What can, what can be wrong with a chocolate bunny? It's hollow. Yeah, or the chocolate is like yucky chocolate or like waxy or like, okay, maybe it's stuffed. This is only slightly better. It's almost unspeakable, but it's slightly better to like have it stuffed with something, marshmallow or yucky yucks. No, like what's a real chocolate bunny? A real chocolate bunny is one that's solid all the way through. Because the whole, like, the whole thing with the hollow thing, like, that's deception. <laughs> really? It, no, I'm serious. It's meant to deceive. You're meant to be like, whoa, this is a chocolate bunny. It is 10 inches of chocolate. <laughs> and, okay, so, like, it's 10 inches of chocolate, but it's like magic shell. But it's not even the good magic shell. It's so horrible, right? Um, God enables God wants us to be whole he's not interested in Christians who are chocolate, hollow chocolate bunnies he wants us full of the best chocolate all the way through so that when life bites us when we are squeezed the stuff that comes out is not air or horrible marshmallow <laughs> but it would be the same stuff that's on the outside right chocolate well okay you know this is a metaphor right obviously we're chocolate is awesome but Jesus right we're supposed to be whole people and there's the good well the news is you and I are not complete I mean we're still mixed with things that are do not look and act and are of Jesus, right? And yet, if you belong to the Lord, he is, he is committed to rooting out all those things. And it will be painful, but he's committed to doing it because he loves you and he wants you to be whole, not fractured. Um, how has God been doing that for you and with you? giving you new desires, new likes, new hopes, new understandings, rearranging your loves, and how well are you cooperating with him? Um, will you thank him for even the small progress? Um, learning about what pleases him? Maybe you've had increased desire to hear his voice. Maybe you're, maybe you're say like, you know what? I'm gonna do, I've got, I have some time. I wanna do, I wanna spend time with the Lord and his word, just me and him. I'm gonna use my BSF lesson to do that. That's a little plug for BSF lesson, by the way. Um, are you willing to trust him to defend you when someone is spreading some really horrible rumors about you? There are all these little things, so, and they seem little, and they're big. They are big fruit. God is winning in big ways. Um, when you are pressed, what still shows as not being like Jesus? Um, I heard that I heard about an ice sculpture. An ice sculptor, when somebody asked him, um, you know, how do you take this block of ice and turn it into a horse? And he said, he cuts off everything that's not that doesn't look like a horse. And so, God is an even better sculptor than that, because He's not just concerned with the outside; He's transforming the inside. The things that don't look like Jesus in your heart and mine, in your life and mine, in our ma your mouth and mine, God is wanting to cut those off. Um, will you invite God into that space? And when you fail, when I fail, will we turn back? 
because we will, if, you, if you've tried to take notes with your uh, non-dominant hand, you will have already figured out like, you feel awkward and you fail. You will fail, I will fail. And yet, um, will you turn back to him, trusting that he loves you and he's committed to you? Confess your sin and thank him for your salvation, which is secure in the finished work of Christ. And then ask for his help and step out again. God is making his people whole, um, not just to have our lives where we look like Jesus on the outside, but transforming us so that all of us, inside and out, um, is like Jesus. How are we doing on time? I imagine I'm way over. Okay, so let's wrap it up. Um, you guys are gonna have fun. Do I? Oh my goodness, okay. Okay, we'll go really fast. Um, Okay, so in chapter seven, you can see here, uh, here's the clue in the text. Um, seven, one, now for the matters you wrote about. Okay, so this is, remember, when we're reading Corinthians, this is a dialogue. We have, we hearing one half of the conversation. No, 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 no. We're hearing a fraction of one half of the conversation. And so we have to remember this is an occasional letter, meaning, it is written by specific people on a specific occasion for specific problems. And so the kind of answers that Paul gives to the questions that the Corinthians had written are not the answers that probably, not the full answers that you and I would want, right? Um, so we have to do, um, following Jesus, reading his word means using your brain. We're gonna have to think about what is the question that they asked why did they ask that question? And what is his answer pointing us to? Um, what does it mean? So, um, uh, okay, so that's gonna be the pattern as we go through. So it's like uh, one section, now the matters you wrote about, it seems that he's quoting his, a letter, it is good for a man not to marry. So that's one section down to um, the next session, seems to be in verse 25. Now about virgins, it's the same. Uh, phrase in Greek that's uh, literally translated and concerning the matter that you wrote about and concerning virgins. Um, and so uh, like it seems like that in this polarized church, okay, there was sexual immorality where people, some people were like, whatever I do with my physical body, no big deal. And then other people were like, wait a minute, we can't have any hint of sexual immorality or any part of it. Like we need to, even husbands and wives, they need to stop. They need to separate and just live as if they were monastics. And Paul is speaking into that situation to say, um, no, uh, husband and wives belong to each other and they should enjoy sexual in intimacy. And if they're to abstain, it should only be for a time and it should be only on mutual consent. And why? Because he says, uh, where does he say this? Um, uh, end of verse five, chapter seven, verse five. Um, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So he is saying he's regarding sexual temptation as a huge deal. And one of the ways to deal with that um, for, like, is that married people would have sex. So um, temp, uh, he's saying temptation to sexual immorality is strong. And that's why he said up above in chapter six, verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. This is not something, um, I mean, we're all sexual beings, right? So you probably know this. I'm gonna preach in the choir in the sense that like, this is a big deal, right? Our bodies can have strange and powerful desires, right? That are not something necessarily that we want. Um, earlier in the Old Testament, it's like, why would you scoop fire on your, on your lap? Like, that's what we're talking about. Like, this is a dangerous situation. Um, and so, um, but he is elevating celibacy for those who are single. And so chapter seven, verse eight and nine, out of the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry for it is better to marry than burn with passion. And so Paul throughout this section um, is not giving a formula, 
but he's affirming wise trusting in God's sovereignty in your circumstance. Be content. Um, you can honor God. You can live a spirit-filled life that honors and increasingly is transformed to look like Jesus in whatever life station you have. And that's, this was especially important for people to hear, people who had been really ambitious. So that's one of the reasons I think that he says later, remain as you are, because they were so ambitious. Like, be content with where you are, um, and then the second question, uh, 725 to 40, he talks about the virgins or the unmarried. Um, and he also had talked about divorce in that earlier section, but you'll talk about it. Um, Paul is upholding, should unmarried people stay unmarried? That seems to be the question that they had asked him. And Paul's answer may confuse us more than it illumines. Um, but if we look at uh, chapter seven, verse 32 to 35, um, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is, is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. Um, see, if there's no front fracture there, but a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So that, my friends, I think is the goal. He's saying the goal for all of our lives as believers should be wholehearted devotion to the Lord. And wherever your life station is, that should be your goal. That should be my goal. Um, and does it impact, like, are we in a relationship? Are we married? Are we single? Absolutely. Um, that is a part of it. Um, and Paul is upholding, I want to say this, because many of you are single. Paul upholds single as honorable. It's almost, and not almost, he calls it even better than being married. So I want you to remember that. Like, even though our culture, our, the American church does not uphold singleness generally as honorable, at least not in how we organize our programs and like spend our time and things like that. Um, two of the greatest people that we follow, Jesus, and then in a, you know, in a much lesser way, Paul, like these are people who are unmarried. And God used them powerfully. And so I would just want to encourage you, if you are single, we need to, whether we're married or not, we need to unlearn the ideas that our culture says about singleness and learn what God says about it. Um, does, does that, like, is there confusion in there too? You know, because maybe you'd want to be, sing want to be married and you haven't, um, you haven't, God hasn't opened that door for you. Um, that's an opportunity. I mean, I don't have any easy answers for that. Um, it's an opportunity to pray and navigate that with wise counsel. Um, I think that's um, basically we can go like from that to a principle is that spirit-filled living is driven by, driven by whose we are, not where we are. Spirit-filled living is driven by whose we are, that we belong to Christ, not where we are. And so the situations of your life, you may wonder, what's going to glorify God? Um, and the dominant question is, do you belong to Christ? Um, if, that is, if you belong to him, then that is your driving force for how you are to live, um, not the driving force being the situation you're in. So how does knowing that God chose you and called you right where you are change how you view your circumstance? Your life has unique opportunities to glorify God that no life in the history of the world has ever had before. But it's also gonna take discernment and humility because there's no life that's ever happened before that's exactly in the same circumstances that you have and you and I, we can't follow formulas. We need to rely on the Lord. We need his wisdom. We need his discernment. We need each other 
to pray and encourage and be with each other in the hard things. Um, it takes discernment and humility to follow Jesus. God's not calling us to be robots. He's not calling us to be formula followers. Um, and maybe you're not thinking about married or singleness. Um, maybe you're thinking about being unemployed. Maybe you're in a dysfunctional family or you have painful relationships. Um, a lot of the time, God calls us to live spirit-filled lives in painful situations. God will be faithful. You and I can trust that God will be faithful to give wisdom and correction as we seek him. The church of Corinth had it rough. Um, they lived in difficult times and difficult culture. They had a lot of things that they had to be rewired from, right? Unlearn, and yet so do we. We live in a difficult time. We live in a difficult culture. And you and I, whether we like it or not, we have breathed the air of our culture. Um, and we, um, we sometimes, just like the Corinthians, forget how to live. We forget who we are. Maybe we don't know it yet. Um, the good news is for you and for me is that God did not leave the Corinthians there. He will not leave us there. He'll be faithful. We can expect God to meet us in the same difficult times um, that even when we forget or we don't understand who we are um, in Christ, um, who he's made us to be, that he will pursue us in that. Um, let's not cover our eyes and peek through just <laughs> with one eye open. Let's face it head on, knowing who we are and therefore how we're to live. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us so much in Christ and that you are opening our eyes to how much, um, what honor and glory you are letting us be a part of. Um, Father, help us in the places where it's hard, and I pray that you would bless the food that we're going to eat and bless the conversation that we're going to have with each other. Um, we pray, Father, that um, your real work will be done in this um, in the time we have left tonight. That you relate, that you will build relationships um, with people. That you will help us to be encouraged and supported. Um, and even corrected that we might um, follow Jesus more faithfully and reflect him, show him, Lord, to the world. We pray in his name, amen.